the broadcast ministry of Christ Way Fellowship brings you victory for today. Exalting the Savior, evangelizing the seeker, and equipping the saint. Committed to the principle that you can have victory today and every day through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And now, here's your host, Pastor Wayne Duncan. Would you open your copy of the Word of God, please, to Romans 14. I want to speak to you tonight from the last portion, the last paragraph of Romans 14. Last week, we focused on our Christian liberty, on our Christian liberty. But tonight, we're going to look at another principle that must stand alongside and balance that principle of liberty, and that's the, re the principle of responsibility. Let's stand together as we honor the reading of the Word of God. <clears throat> you follow along in your translation. Verse 13, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. But rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who is this way serves Christ, for he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we're so grateful for this wonderful day that we've had, this wonderful day of experiencing God, uh, not just through the last hour and a half in our discipleship training, but experiencing you throughout this day as we've opened your word, as we have studied it during our Sunday school hours as we have opened your word and proclaimed it, exposing the truth in your word, showing the pictures of salvation there. And Father, we're grateful for the experience that we've had of worshiping you and sensing your presence right here in our midst. Now, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, that you will bind Satan and that you will cast him from our midst tonight. Father, I pray that each one of us will get what you have to say to us. That we might, each one, go away from this place tonight knowing that we have heard a word from God for us. Lord, we're grateful that you speak to us all, but we know that you long to speak to us each. Because you don't just love us all, you love us each. Now help us, Lord, to rightly divide your word tonight. Is my prayer in Jesus' name and all God's people say Amen. Would you be seated, please? <clears throat> dress as I dress and do as I do, for that's the only way I'll get along with you. 
<laughs> you know, and I know, and it's sad. That there are churches, there are fellowships that could put that on the heading of their bulletin. Because their great concern is that everyone conforms. Now, maybe you have been involved in a denomination or a church like that sometime in the past, and it's not our purpose tonight to put those people down. Our purpose tonight is simply to expose the truth. That's what we seek to do when we open, open the Word of God. And you've been in those, those circumstances, I'm sure, where there was just a certain type of translation that you were supposed to use of the Word of God. There was a certain style of haircut you were supposed to have. There was a certain mode of dress that you were supposed to come in. There were certain attitudes. There were certain, uh, well, you just name it. Go on and on. You can, you can fill, fill that list up. You know what I'm talking about. And yet it is so contrary to what the Word of God tells us about the liberty that is ours in Christ. Now last week as we looked at that first paragraph in chapter 14, we were dealing there with the circumstance that was going on in Rome at that time where people were coming in from Judaism, they were coming in from paganism, and as they came in they brought certain uh, uh, teachings, certain understandings, certain scruples that they had, that they had been taught, they had been brought up by certain, certain observances with the Jew It had to do a good deal with the observance of certain days of the week and certain days on the calendar of the year, the Passover, Yom Kippur, the Sabbath, of course. And it had to do with days, with the pagan most often, and with the Jew, it had to do with diet. And you recall all those uh, very uh, careful uh, dietary laws that we find over in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus? And then add to that the pagans that were coming into the church that were coming from a circumstance where animals were being sacrificed to demons that were posing as gods. And they were very scrupulous about not eating that meat that they would buy at the, at the market, the meat market, for fear that they would be entering into some kind of a, uh, of a union or fellowship with the worship of those false gods. And so they came into the church with these scruples, with these, with these hangovers, with these things that were carried over from the way they had been raised up. Now, we're not any different than that. <clears throat> Depending on your age group here tonight or what denomination uh, you were raised in, and we've got people that have come into temple from all kinds of denominations, from all kinds of backgrounds. We're a pretty diverse group. And, and, and you have brought some of those things with you, and I have brought some of those things with me. And last week when we were talking about the weak brother, that one that is still bound up in those things, and the strong brother, the one that, that understands that we have liberty regarding the things that are morally uh, without any, uh, any uh, expression in the Word of God. And did you kind of go away feeling like I did? That I'm, I'm not a weak brother, but I'm not really a very strong brother either. You see, the truth is, we're all kind of mixtures, aren't we? We're all kind of mixtures of weak and strong. We've all come up with certain things ingrained in us about what is right and what is wrong. Maybe something the Word of God doesn't speak at all about. It may be some habit. It may be some practice. It may be some observance of a special day that we grew up with. And, and so we still kind of feel a little uneasy when it comes to, to violating our conscience and going on and, and practicing that liberty. We find ourselves kind of an, a mixture of weak and strong. It's just like over in the book of 1 Corinthians when it talks about the spiritual man and the carnal man, both Christians. One of them is the spiritual man, the man that has Christ on the throne in his life. The other one is the carnal man who has Christ in his life but not leading his life. And you know, we're all sometimes kind of a mixture of that too. There are days that we seem to be really spiritual people. And then there are days that we seem to be very carnal. And there are moments in a day when we seem to be spiritual. And there are moments in that same day when we, when we sense ourselves to be pretty carnal. And it's the same way when it comes to this matter of the weak brother and the strong brother. 
And when he's speaking here about the weak brother, what he is, what he is really zeroing in on is he is zeroing in on the new convert, the new believer who has just received the Lord Jesus, has just come to Christ in faith, had his sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb, has come into the faith, come into the family of God, and is now part of the church, but he's so new that he hasn't understood from the Word of God that there, there is great liberty in the Christian faith. And so that's what he's, he's primarily concerned with, is that new believer, that, that weak brother that's just coming in. He's, he's really not here zeroing in, in that, on that Christian that has been a Christian for years, and he is so stuck in legalism that... Uh, that the Lord in a stick of dynamite couldn't get him out of it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're just those that that's, they're died in the wool legalists. That's the way they're going to live their lives. That's the way they're going to view everything and accept for a, a real intervention from, the, from the, the Lord. That's the way they're going to live. They're just going to be like that. There's not much you can do about it. Now, in a circumstance like that, I don't believe that the, the Word of God teaches us that we're to be a slave to those kind of people. That we are to... Those of us that are coming to an understanding of our liberty in Christ, that we are to enjoy and walk in that liberty. And we're to lead the new believer, the new convert, to understand what great liberty he has. But as we look at this together tonight, now we're moving from that, that focus on liberty to a focus on responsibility. Victor Frankel a well-known Christian psychologist has said, he's from Europe, and he has said that he very often chides his American audiences, and he, and he not only chides them, but he also seeks to warn his American audiences that if we're not very careful, that the liberty that we enjoy in this country is going to turn into sheer arbitrariness. And he says that just as we have the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor that we ought also to construct a statue of responsibility in San Francisco Bay in order that it might balance. I can say amen to that, can you? I believe we need something like that. We need that as a country. I think that's one of the things that's, that's so wrong with America today is that as Americans are so focused on their liberty and what they can do, they don't realize that with liberty comes responsibility. But that's not just true as a country. We need to see that as Christians. And hey, listen, we don't need statues. We've got God's statutes. <laughs> Amen? And God tells us here that, that we are to practice that liberty and enjoy the liberty that we have in Christ, but we're to do it with responsibility. So the first thing that I want you to notice with me tonight as we begin to to open up this passage together, I want you to understand in the first part of this that you and I need to determine that we will not practice our liberty in such a way to ever be a problem. Practice our liberty in such a way that we will never be a problem. Now let's look at the kind of problem we can be for each other. Verse 13. He says, let us not judge one another. Why should we not judge one another? Do you remember from last week? Well, back in verse 12, he said that we will give an account to God. You don't give an account to me for you. I don't give an account to you for me. We give an account to God for ourselves. So we're not to judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put, now look at that word, obstacle, an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. An obstacle. And what he's speaking of here, what that word has to do with is when you would uh, put, say like a, a roadblock in the, in the way of a Christian brother that's making progress on his Christian life. He's growing in his faith. He's, he's developing as a Christian. He's moving fast. He's, he's learning about the things that he has in the Lord. And then because of, of your irresponsibility in practicing your liberty, suddenly you have placed a roadblock, an obstacle in its place. 
The next word that he uses there, the next two words, stumbling block, that really has to do with a snare or a trap. You see, if we're not very careful, those that are experiencing and learning about our liberty, if we're not very careful and a new believer comes in and he still has scruples about things he was brought up with, the laws of man and all this kind of stuff that he picked up on, what mama said, mama don't allow, <laughs> you know. <laughs> if we're not careful, we can not only put a, a roadblock up that will stop him cold on his Christian progress, we can also set a trap for that person. And what I mean by that is that we can practice our liberty before someone that is, that is so sold out to legalism and hasn't really come to an understanding of how the liberty that he has in the Lord and we just, we just go ahead and practice our liberty in front of him and we get him to come on and join in with us in things that, that he really just doesn't feel good about. You know what happens? You cause him to violate his conscience. He hasn't, he hasn't really understood yet. The Spirit of God hasn't made it clear to him yet. And, and he's still stumbling. He's still, uh, still uh, all bound up in those things, in those, those uh, legalistic and legal things that he was brought up with, those things that, that are a hangover, a hang-on from his previous experience before he ever came to the liberty that's in Christ. So we need to practice our liberty in such a way that, that we don't become a problem to a brother. We don't want to cause someone to hit a roadblock on his progress toward fulfilling his, his uh, Christian life. And we don't want to make a trap, set a trap for him so that he falls into a snare just because of the fact that, that we are, are practicing our liberty and we encourage him to come along and do what we're doing and... and uh, but can really cause a problem there. Donald Gray Barnhouse has said it like this. Now we have as Christians, before I, I give you this quote from him, let's just talk about this for a minute. We have a broad, broad way when it comes to the liberty that we have in Christ. Now we're not talking about things that the Word of God speaks clearly about being wrong. We're not to do those things. In the next verse, he says, I am convinced that nothing is unclean of itself. He's not talking about... He's not talking about adultery. He's not talking about uh, uh, fornication. He's not talking about pornography. He's not talking about, uh, well, you just fill in the blanks. He's not talking about things that the Word of God is clear on. He's talking about those things that have really no moral connotation to all, at all, those things that, are, that we are at liberty to enjoy. And so the Christian, here's what Donald Gray Barnhouse says. He says, we have a broad plane on which to travel. But the Christian, by his responsibility, may choose to walk the sharp edge of the sword. We've got liberty. But friend, listen, we're not supposed to practice that liberty before someone that we are going to cause to hit a roadblock or fall into a trap. Now let's move on. We'll see something else here that he says that we are to be careful about. Verse 15, he says... Don't practice your food. Now remember, he's dealing with the circumstances that were going on right then. He was dealing with uh, well, something that might have been uh, something that might have been, say, 25 or 30 years ago, and maybe still a problem for some folks that, that were raised in, uh, in Catholicism. No meat on Friday, right? Remember when you went to school and you passed you, you went down the tray? You got that train, you went down the, the school lunch line, and you always had that rotten fish on Friday. That was, <laughs> you remember that, don't you? <laughs> and uh, that was because that there were people that would be offended if there was meat served. Now that, that is just an illustration. I don't, mean to, to, I don't mean to make fun of anybody by that. Don't take that wrong if that's part of your background. But, but here's a perhaps modern way of interpreting this. He says in verse 15, not to let your food, uh, for, for if because of food your brother is hurt, is hurt. Now someone might get saved out of a denomination that has dietary laws. They come in here to temple to uh, potluck and praise night or Wednesday night or one of our suppers and they found out we'll eat anything that won't eat us first. 
And I hear a big, amen. amen. <laughs> That's right. And they're offended by that. You see? He says, don't let your brother be hurt. And that is to be grieved, to be hurt on the inside. They may just sit there and accept what's going on around them, but deep in their heart, they're thinking, this just isn't right. Now, as time goes by and as the word of God is exposed to those people, they'll begin to understand. They'll begin to walk in more and more liberty. Then he says, not only hurt, but he says, do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Hmm. Boy, does that bring it in perspective? Man, I, I want to walk in as much liberty as I possibly can. Man, I, I, I want to be free. I'm free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's, there's, there's liberty. And I want to walk in just as much liberty as I can. But friend, listen. If it's going to hurt somebody that Jesus thought enough of to die for, I'm kind of willing to hold back. Are you? Are you willing to hold back on your liberty if it's going to hurt somebody in that way, if it's going to destroy that brother? Because you see, just as it describes a little bit later on in verse 20, it says, Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Look on down to verse 23. For he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. And so here's the picture. We practice our liberty before someone who doesn't have a clear conscience about it. And because he wants to go along with the group, peer pressure is just as strong in church as it is anywhere else. Because he wants to go along with the group, he just goes ahead and he does what everybody else is doing. But deep in his heart, he just doesn't feel right about it. We've caused that brother to violate his conscience. Friend, listen, once you, can, once you cause somebody to begin to violate their conscience, you've got them on the road to destruction. Because one little violation can lead to another and another and another and another. And the next thing you know, once saved, always saved. Don't forget that. But you can cause someone to be shipwrecked in their faith. Where their Christian life is miserable for them where they resent every minute of it. They don't understand it. They don't understand what's going on. They can't be clear in their own heart about what, what's happening. And you've destroyed a brother's joy. And so the first thing that we need to do is to determine that we are not going to practice our liberty in such a way as to be a problem. Now the second thing that we need to agree upon is that we need to agree that we are determined to let our love always be a blessing. See, there's a negative here and there's a positive. The negative is we're not going to let our liberty be a problem. And the positive is we're going to let the love of God that's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit to be a blessing to all. Look with me, verse 16. He says, therefore, do not let what is good, what is a good thing be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I love that verse. When I pray for Glenda, I, I like to pray that the Lord will just fill her day with righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You see, <laughs> it's so sad. It is so sad that so many have been convinced that Christianity is keeping a bunch of rules. They've been convinced that Christianity is, is do, 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 or don't, don't, don't. But listen, Christianity is not do, do, do. It's not don't, don't, don't. Christianity is done. <laughs> Are you with me on this? Christianity is done. It, it was done when Jesus died for us <laughs> and we received him by the grace of God. We were saved. It was done, huh? That was it. It's not do this, do this, do this. It's not don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. 
Friend, listen, the, the, the kingdom of God is joy. Look at this with me. What is the kingdom of God? He says it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. What is righteousness anyway? Righteousness, remember from our earlier studies in Romans, righteousness is what? It's a right standing before God. We are declared to be righteous by God based on the sacrifice of Christ and our union with Him. Amen, that's the kingdom of God. You're not going to get more righteousness <laughs> as far as your position. Now, you can get more righteous in your practice, but as far as your position, you're as righteous as you're going to get. That's right. I'm not discouraging you from moving on and trying to, 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 to uh, <laughs> progress in your Christian life, but as far as the declaration of righteousness, that came when you received Christ. The kingdom of God is righteousness. The kingdom of God is peace. Then listen, if you're in the Lord Jesus Christ, then if you've been saved by the grace of God, you have what few people in this earth have. You've got peace with God. It's not that God is angry with us. It's that man is angry with God. <laughs> That's what reconciliation is all about. It's not, it's not reconciling God to us. It's reconciling us to God. Righteousness peace. And listen, friend, if you've got righteousness and peace, you ought to be at up with joy. <laughs> Is that right? Say right. Right. Yeah, that's right. Man, if you, got, if you are walking in that righteousness and peace that you've got in the Lord, you ought to be just filled with joy. I don't care. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. There ought to be somewhere in your heart, you ought, there ought to be a little shouting place where you can go and just get joy. <laughs> because things are cool between you and God. That's right. That's right. Now he says here that that's, that's what the kingdom of God is. Now look at verse 19. And here's another way that we can determine that we are going to, by our love, always be a blessing. Look at verse 19. So then let us pursue. And that word for pursue is to hunt down relentlessly. That's what that word means. I mean, put the bloodhounds on it. Pursue relentlessly peace and building up of one another. You know what goes on in most fellowships? I'm just going to tell the truth tonight about this. What goes on in most fellowships, most Christian groups, is put down. You know that? Put down. This group, putting that group down. This individual, putting that individual down. Friend, listen, that's exactly the opposite of what the Word says. The Word says we ought to set the bloodhounds out on peace and on building each other up. That's what it's all about. Building each other up. Man, I love to build somebody up, don't you? Don't you just love to, to just pat somebody on the back and say, man, you're doing a great job. Praise, I praise God for you being here in this church. You're a blessing to me. Don't you love to do that? I don't mean, uh, you know, I mean really <laughs> from the heart, blessing people. That's what he says we're to do. We're to, we're to really bless people in this way. We're going to do that. If we're going to let our love be a blessing. And friend, we're going to have to pace ourselves with those that are not as liberated as we are. You know, World War II, there were those great convoys of ships that were guarded by destroyers and, and uh, submarines and all kinds of naval vessels. The Navy, World War II Navy men over here, those big convoys across the Atlantic. You were in the Pacific, though, weren't you, brother? Those big convoys going across there. And, and do you know who set the pace for the convoy? The slowest vessel. The slowest one. You take your family out and go say, we're going to walk around the block. What pace are you going to go at? Well, for about the first two, two uh, yard lengths, you're going, to, you're going to be running trying to keep up with that two or three year old. But after that, things will slow down some, won't you? <laughs> and if you make it around that whole block without carrying that little toddler, you're going to find yourself keeping pace with him and he's not going to be keeping pace with you. 
And so those of us that are developing some strength by the grace of God, we need to, by our love, by the grace of God, we need to pace ourselves with those that just haven't come into the liberty that there is in Christ as yet. Can you say amen to that? See, there's a world of difference between a legalist and a lover. <laughs> a legalist says, I can't. But the lover says, I can. But because of love, I won't. See the difference? Big difference. Let's pray about it. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this careful instruction that you give us about the Christian life. And I'm so grateful, Lord, that we have a great, great liberty in Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that Christianity is not a bunch of rules we've got to keep. I'm glad we don't get to heaven on the point system. I'd never make it. I'd never make it. I thank you, Lord, that your grace, your unmerited favor, is what opens the door, lets us come in, and then keeps us carefully to the end. Now, Father, I pray for those that are confused about this message tonight. There may be some here that, that just hadn't gotten it. And I won't be surprised about that. But, Father, by your spirit, you can help to clarify their minds on this. I ask you that you would help each one of us to, to not just uh, uh, pass through this time of opening your word together and listening to this message without putting some things into practice in our lives. Help us, to be, help us to be very, very careful about one another. Help us, Lord, to treasure each other greatly. Help us not to, to, to cause someone to have a barricade in the road of progress, not to be caught in the snare, not to be hurt, not to be brought down because we've not acted correctly. Father, we love you. Oh, we, we love you so much. And we long to be with you. And we know one day soon we will be. Until that day, help us, Lord, by your grace, to live the way you want us to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please? And let me say something that I say quite often when we've had messages like this. This has to do with conduct. This has to do with conduct as a Christian. It doesn't have to do with becoming a Christian. We're not saved by our conduct. We're saved by putting our faith in Jesus. Maybe sometime in the past you've walked down an aisle, but you didn't open that door to your heart. The Bible says, as Christ is speaking, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. That's what I would invite you to do tonight. If you've never been saved, man, listen, I urge you to be saved. You've been a Christian for 18 years. It's great. <laughs> it's great. Come on, receive Jesus tonight. If you're here as a believer tonight, and you know that you're saved, but Jesus is not really reigning in your life. I invite you to come tonight. Maybe you talk to one of these counselors. Maybe talk to me. Maybe pray together with us. Or just get off by yourself somewhere. Put Jesus back in the driver's seat in your life. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. But we can quench the Spirit. We can move Him away from the controls. Maybe you want to come tonight. You want to reaffirm His Lordship in your life. Perhaps there's visitors here tonight that God has made clear that this is where He wants you to be a member well, every way this church receives members, we just open the door real wide and say, come on in. we got a great work to do. You might as well be a part of it. <laughs> if God's calling you to be a part of it, come on. Man, come on. It's going to be great. You come. Man. Nellie is playing and Waylon is going to sing. Let me ask you to bow your heads. Close your eyes. Seek the Lord for your own needs tonight.